So we uh, are in for another retro review, and uh, this, according to my television, is episode 14 of the first season, and on my Paramount app on my phone is episode 15, so we're going to give up on the numbers for a while and uh, just call this uh, Balance of Terror after this. Hello out there, I'm the oldest nerd, and today we're talking of Balance of Terror. Uh, this is um, probably not the first time they've used the eye lighting for Kirk, but uh, it's most noticeable here uh, from the very beginning in the ship's chapel, I think the only time they ever showed it, and uh, and then the uh, on all the bridge scenes and things like this, possibly in his quarters as well, where they have this, this uh, uh, light that's right on his eyes most of the time. You can tell in a couple of places where he looks down and the light's on his forehead. So um, uh, probably uh, was not intended to, uh, to do that. At any rate, uh, we notice a few things in this episode. If you recall, Balance of Terror is the first uh, encounter with the Romulans. They have uh, crossed over to our side of the neutral zone and destroyed several of the Earth outposts. This was uh, reimagined in the last season of uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, where uh, Pike is sent to the future and uh, is in command of the Enterprise instead of Kirk during this same incident. And his approach to it was different than Kirk's, but uh, led into a war with the Romulans. So uh, Kirk's decision-making here was all the difference in avoiding war with the Romulans. And uh, they um, show in this episode uh, just how carefully they thought it out, just how many doubts actually that Kirk had about this as voice to McCoy, uh, reminiscent of the scene in The Cage, later the Menagerie, where uh, Pike is showing doubts to the doctor. It's almost uh, the same scene except without the drink. At any rate, um, there are a few things that are different than what we'll see in later episodes. Uh, they talk about maximum speed. I think they eventually said maximum warp uh, near the end of the episode, uh, but uh, they weren't uh, uh, clear as to whether they were on warp power or impulse power. Uh, then uh, there are uh, uh, there is a um, they don't have a red alert that they call for, but rather a condition red. And in this condition red, which, uh, by the way, the decals, uh, the, the uh, displays on bridge, uh, always said condition alert, uh, even uh, long after they started calling it red alert. They never changed the graphic on that. At any rate, uh, while there is this uh, condition alert, uh, the, this condition red, uh, people are just walking down the corridors like there's nothing happening because, of course, it's stock footage and uh, it's supposed to show normal activities uh, around the ship. But I would think if you were in kind of any kind of alert thing, you'd be uh, not uh, just leisurely going down the corridors, but running somewhere. And uh, they do have that in other parts of the episode, but this one I found just kind of interesting uh, that, that they're just kind of wandering about. Then uh, we have um, mentions of um, by... Um, uh, Lieutenant Stiles, who is uh, this week's navigator, who uh, is the poster child for um, uh, Vulcan discrimination. Uh, he is, uh, of course, um, seeing the light before the end of the episode, but um, he mentions that uh, he had ancestors that served in the space service during the Romulan War 100 years earlier. Uh, they talk about command base rather than Starfleet command. Uh, once again, they have a higher level of alert, which they call battle stations. Uh, never mention general quarters, which is uh, generally how the military does it, the Navy does. The, they'll call general quarters, or at least they used to, in order to indicate um, uh, time to go to battle stations. They didn't use the word cloaking device, but were mystified by the Romulans being able to disappear. Uh, pretty much guessed what it was by saying that it was an energy shield that uh, was not only uh, 
obscuring their view of the Romulan vessel, but the Romulan's vessel of them. And that's a clever plot device because they're able then to basically use the outline done by so many submarine movies where uh, one commander is trying to outthink the other one. This is the first time I think in this episode that Spock calls the captain Jim in a stressful situation. Uh, we see uh, Mark Leonard the first time as uh, the Romulan commander. They don't give him a name. Uh, he has a uh, trusted second, which they call Centurion, who is an older officer. They, uh, they go back to that in uh, later episodes of that rank uh, by Next Generation. Uh, the term isn't heard much. And uh, also, they redo the idea of Romulan rank. The... Um, uh, subsequent episodes had a sub-commander who was a ship commander, and a full commander would be a fleet commander. In this case, the commander was just of the one ship, or so it would seem. They mentioned in a briefing room scene that the hardest substance known to them is castrodinium, and uh, that's never mentioned again. Uh, later, they talk, they talk about neutronium as being a very hard substance, or tritanium uh, in uh, The Next Generation, but I don't think I've ever heard the um, castrod castrodinium term any time uh, after that. A couple of interesting things, and we noticed this way back when, that uh, when they fired phasers, they very much looked like photon torpedoes, and that they had to shoot them from a regular room. Later, Sulu could just push a button on the panel, so it seemed to be uh, uh, much more centralized. They wanted it to do, like, once again, the submarine uh, film, where they had to, you know, manually load the torpedoes and push the button on the end of the torpedo tube to make it work. And, and I'm certain that was their intention there by having a phaser room in the same way you would have a torpedo room. And I'm not so certain that they knew the difference between phasers and photon torpedoes at that point, because from the pilot, they were still calling them lasers. So maybe lasers and phasers were both on this ship and they later called one phasers and the other photon torpedoes. Uh, you know, that that's um, in the growing stage of the series. So, and uh, this is of course, uh, uh, one of the earlier ones filmed, so uh, they hadn't come up with the idea of uh, a lot of their format uh, uh, until probably the second half of the season. Uh, a couple of things that bother me here is that uh, Yeoman Rand just walks into the captain's quarters without knocking. Uh, thankfully, he's fully clothed laying on his bed, but I mean, uh, did, would that have mattered uh, to her or to him for that matter? Uh, I didn't care for the idea where uh, they have 10 seconds before this Romulan plasma weapon's going to hit them and he hugs the yeoman. Uh, that's something that they even mentioned in the making of Star Trek uh, in the book saying that was just bad writing. Uh, you, don't, uh, you would not have on a military ship uh, a person uh, hugging his uh, um, uh, female officer uh, as things are going to happen. He would be uh, in charge. He would be in command. And that's uh, unusual for Kirk, especially in that uh, time. They were still kind of trying to make Yeoman Rand kind of his girlfriend, kind of the captain's woman, as they brought up in the um, uh, uh, later uh, alternate universe Kirk. Um Otherwise, uh, I thought it was, except for a few clunky lines, uh, uh, McCoy uh, being a little too poetic, saying that Jim Kirk should take care of Jim Kirk. Uh, other than that, I thought it was a well-written episode. It, it had uh, a, a lot of suspense in it. It had uh, the uh, understanding that there were good commanders on both sides and that they wouldn't be enemies, maybe, if they uh, had uh, different political setups. So uh, that's what we think about for Balance of Terror. It was well done and uh, uh, showing that even in the 23rd century, there is still a little bigotry, at least against people with pointed ears. So until next time, we hope that you subscribe to the channel and uh, let us know what you think uh, in the comments below. We enjoy reading them and we answer as many as we can. And uh, until next time, don't go far.